So, I'm starting Origins, How We Became Human. Now, I have to say, first thing I noticed when I opened the box, these maps fold, and they're kind of the biggest thing in there. If you notice, the box size is just not terribly fitted to the components. And this is kind of a shame because it means shipping, etc., is more painful for a box this size. That's just a very initial impression here. All right, the next thing is, well, I usually like to read the rules to a game before I play. In this case, I've found that impossible. I've tried reading them twice, uh, and I just cannot focus on them. Uh, this has to be the worst case uh, for... So, various Eklund games have given me trouble with the rules. There's been uh, Sierra, Ma Sierra Madre's uh, primary designer who, I believe, wrote this one. Um, the designs in his rules have tended... Initially, the early ones, um, Lords of Sierra Madre, for example, Lords of the Renaissance, were fairly readable. I had an idea of what the game was about, but I really needed to play it to understand how the rules interacted. Okay. That's sort of minimal. Um, High Frontier, I found very much a struggle, mainly because of the layout of the rules. Because to tell you the truth, the actual rules of it are quite simple. And this may be the same case. Uh, with American Megafauna, I had the advantage of being taught the new version by uh, the designer himself. Which, as you can imagine, is a significant advantage. You know, it's always easier to learn a game when someone who already knows it well teaches you. And who would know it better, right? Granted, it was a work in progress at that point. Uh, this was for the BIOS megafauna. Uh, but then when I picked up my own copy of American Megafauna, I understood a lot of the concepts well enough to just jump in. Well, here's one with another a lot of concepts that aren't very familiar and they're not being exposed in a very good way, in my opinion. Let's start with this, because I'm explaining to some extent why I'm going to do this the way I am. I'm going to just muddle through my first game. Uh, I can't get a grasp on these rules. So, one of the first things that you notice with it is there's strategy tips, and here are some here, spread throughout the rules. It's hard to find the rules, is I guess my problem. Uh, and that's a combination of a number of things, one of which is the strategy tips being in large sections. Okay, I could live with that. Two sets of languages just kind of mingled in with each other. I mean, we got English and German. Okay, that looks pretty, you know, it looks like we're following a certain pattern here. Still... The English is in these little boxes, and I guess that's the answer, except this is sort of not in a little box, and it becomes very hard to distinguish what's what. And then things like public cards, which is a pretty big issue, and I think I figured out what the answer is, aren't really well defined in the rules from what I can see. And, you know, as I start to work my way through, I'm realizing... I'm just not going to get this. I mean, I am not going to get this through reading the rules, fiddling with the pieces a little bit. i got to play the damn thing um, and probably mess a lot up and not get things. All right, so what's the storyline on the game? That's kind of hard to tell, too. So first of all, there's rules for Expansion 4, and this is the same problem Hunt High Frontier has. Uh, there's rules for, for this... Uh, era 4, there can't be a whole lot of extra components for it, but it didn't come with the base game, which means 
that since I bought mine used from somebody who didn't have that expansion, and the expansion's out of print, I got me a incomplete game. Um, I can play this. I can play it fully, but the game is designed for that fourth deck. That's very clear. Uh, you know, maybe a minor quibble because I certainly would rather have the game designed from the beginning for four decks than all kinds of little add-on pieces. It takes up enough table space as it is. It covers the history of humanity, sort of. Um, so, at the start of the game, you're playing different species, essentially. I mean, we have uh, Archaic homo, homo Sapiens Alpha, Homo Heidelbergenus. Uh, but we also have our homo, homo Sapiens somewhere. We have Homo Erectus, which you know, may have existed contemporaneously. Homo Neanderthalus, who certainly did. And you play these for the first era. And you're trying to spread out and, I guess, make things good for whoever you are. Hey, I don't have any idea how to win the game, actually. Uh, couldn't make it that far in the rules, I'm afraid. It looks like the actions you take... I've got this little player aid card, which gives kind of the turn actions. And the game changes between era 1 and 2. Once you hit era two, everybody's the same species then. And they're playing, instead of map using this brain map to indicate some natural abilities, it's kind of assumed, I guess, that they have all of them. And you're just entering different eras, which means that you're capable of owning cards, which have abilities, based on those eras. So it goes from sort of a a species competition game to one that maybe is more cultural in nature and that's certainly how the uh, the cards are, are reflected the the player aids or something reflects these it's hard to tell because I've got you know it's written more in German than in English because of course they're based out of uh, Arizona which is noted as a German speaking country um, Looks like there's useful little player aids here, if you can read them, uh, that may be more valuable than the uh, rules themselves of trying to understand what's going on. Over here we have different technologies that affect different aspects of the game. And these rise and fall, apparently, through the cards and maybe some other mechanisms. It's hard to get a grasp on the game when you can't read the rules, right? Okay. Uh, and then there's all these nice little pictures to tell you what different things are. There's things, though, that aren't well defined to me. So if most words, I'm able to figure out what the word means and what the effect might be. So things like encephalization, yeah, okay, whatever. What that says is that you lose the brain unit on that instinct, which I think is a good thing, because I think that means you gain the instinct. Maybe it's the opposite, I'm not sure. But it's got something to do with the head, right? You know? Fecundity, decrease, okay. Maybe uh, it's a bit of obscure choices of words, but okay, I can get them. I got no idea from the rules, from anything, what silverback means. Um, and that seems to be important because silverback is one of the primary innovation actions you can take. And it requires an alpha. An alpha is uh, socialization. And you get two fecundity increases and your population grows and then you get I think a bonus on the stability roll. It looks like uh, stability. You want to roll high, I guess, or something. Okay, but uh, what am I doing? I got no idea. I'm silverbacking. Is that related to silverfish? I don't know. 
it would be nice. And there's this whole section of information back here. And Silverback may be in here. I think I've scanned through it looking for it. I can't find it. And these are all listed as endnotes with a number to them. And I can't find a number associated with Silverback. Maybe it means paper money. <laughs> I got no idea. But it would be nice to use words that are accessible to people. And I think Silverback is going further. I mean, I have a, a fair vocabulary from what I understand. I can look at most of these and get some idea, but I got no idea what a Silverback is. So that doesn't help. And yes, I'm ranting here. It doesn't help that the best, that the only way to understand what a public card is that I've been able to find is to look through the deck and say, hey, some of them look like this, and some of them look like these idea cards, but that's not clearly distinguished, and it's not absolutely certain that idea cards aren't also public. The difference between the two public cards go up for auction. There's very few of these big cards in the deck. They seem more likely like they have these catastrophes on them. So they make more sense to me. All right. Well, I've babbled a lot without saying much about the game, which is fair because I don't know much about the game. What do you do in a turn? Well, you're allowed to do innovation actions equal to your innovation number. How do you get your innovation number? Damned if I know. We'll find out as we go forward, I guess. Um, there are additional requirements on these, however. So, for example, Silverback is very clearly marked. You need an alpha. Okay. Lexicalization. You need an exclamation point. And you can look on here to see what those are. That's language for the exclamation point. Alpha with socialization. Okay. Cool. Some of these give you cards. Uh, Imitator allows you to ransack people's discard piles. Everybody has their own discard pile, even though we have a shared draw deck. Okay, I'm not sure what gets things discarded, but okay. Uh, something gives you cards, though. Ah, yes, novel behavior. You're allowed to draw a new card with that, and that's in Era 1. There's probably something similar in Era 2 and later uh, and to allow you to get cards. Again, the rules do not make it clear. Here's the game. Now here's the specifics, or anything along those lines, and they're so muddled with other stuff that you leave someone like me, and maybe there's people who can figure this out quicker, but someone like me is left with, I got no idea. Now I am determined enough, because I've enjoyed Sierra Madre games enough, to push through it. But if you don't want to make that effort, I wouldn't get this unless you got somebody who already knows it teaching you. And then you get to see the game and say, do I want to learn this? Okay. So some of the cards will have catastrophes, and if you draw one of them, you turn it up and you take care of the catastrophe, and that could change these cards, although that also is not terribly well explained anywhere. It doesn't really come into play until here. And then they got this kind of nice grayscale thing to explain what the colors on here mean and you gotta kinda use a little bit of deduction to figure that out. It's not impossible but I'll probably screw it up. Um, then you must pl each player gets their own turn. Now that's a little different from some Eklund games. So you do all of these actions on your own turn. Uh, then you have to play cards down to your hand sides. Public cards you must reveal and they go up for auction. I'm not sure. Uh, you're auctioning by spending elders, and you do an elder expenditure. And that's explained somewhere, kinda, maybe. There we go. Uh, and I guess you're bidding elders to move down. And some of the cards have little bonuses which indicate something. <laughs> Useful, huh? Uh, and administration adds one to stability role. Well, that's sort of explained there in a lot of words. Allows population action. I'm assuming that these... 
I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to have to try to muddle through it, and maybe by the end of this time, we'll have an idea of what this game is about. But why don't we look to see a little bit more here. Um, you make a stability roll, which is a roll against how big you are, basically. And you may have abilities that modify that roll, technologies that make it possible to maintain a larger well, species to begin with, which makes no sense, and then culture later, which makes a lot of sense. Sort of. Except because large cultures could actually spread out without one ruling population, and they don't really require a lot of stability for that, I don't think. But, okay. Uh, population actions, well, Another series of actions you're allowed to do, and you're allowed to do them equal to the num your population number and however many elders you want to expend, I guess. Okay? Um, then you can kind of attack people with sieges, and I tried understanding that already and walked away from that without knowing, partially because footprint isn't clearly defined anywhere. Boy, I hope I can find it by the time I need to understand Footprint. So, I know what Footprint does. It's how many people you can have in an area. But, I don't know where it comes from. And, there doesn't seem to be a number for Footprint anywhere. And, maybe in my uh, anger at trying to wade through these rules, I couldn't find it. Or, maybe it's just not anywhere where I've looked yet. Maybe it's past the point where I've given up. Well, hopefully we'll know when we need it. Otherwise, we'll make up some number or roll a die or something, right? <laughs> okay, and then resolve uh, starvation hexes. If you and other people share a space, and see, here's the thing. You can live in here, and I guess that takes up your entire footprint worth of space, but other people around you are also in your space. So they have to have a higher footprint to even move there or something, unless they're going to siege, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Again, this is how I react when you give me rules that I can't comprehend. Uh, I'm used to being given rules that make some sense. And this does not seem like a terribly complex game. It just seems like you made a puzzle of the rules here to make it so that it's really inaccessible. All right, so let's try to figure out whether there's victory conditions listed anywhere. That would be nice. There are. I know there's end of game rolls. I saw them somewhere. Here we go. Uh, first player who enters the era four dark age because of the way I'm playing. Now determining the winner, you get victory points according to your letter of your player. Each player identity counts the specified public card ranks held in his repertoire, suppressed or unsuppressed, for all, or all the units in his elder pool, as noted below. To this total is added the player's innovation and population. Those are good numbers. Okay, so I have a choice of either adding specified. Okay, so say I'm A. My victory points is the number of elders of any color in my pool. Remember, I can capture other people. Uh, well, when I siege people, I can, or do other things maybe, I can capture some of their elders. Um, hmm. What is the specified public card ranks? I bet it's the symbols being listed here. So here we have administration and information. However many of those I have, that could be my victory points, or it could be the number of elders of any color in my pool. One or the other, I think, is what they're trying to say with this. They've given an example. Player N has two units in the elder pool and several public... If I was the kind of person who liked examples, maybe that would help. Uh, but I like my rules to actually make sense to begin with. Player N has two units in her, his or her elder pool and several public cards, two of which are culture. One with one star, and the other with three stars. Okay, so two units in the elder pool. 
that's two elders, or uh, one with one star, that's one, and the other with three, so that's four. Five, six, seven, eight. So I'm coming to either eight or six, but definitely not ten. It sounds like they're adding everything here. Uh, each player counts the specified public cards or all the units in the Elder Pool. All right, which is wrong? Is it the example that's wrong or the rules? Damned if I know. There's probably some living rules or some errata somewhere for that. But yeah, that's uh, that does not lead me to a lot of uh, confidence in being able to find the answers I need to the rules. So how do you win? Well, it depends on which rule, you, whether you want to follow the rules or the example. I always follow rules over examples, so that or is going to exist. Um, the example, I just cancel out. I think it's a more interesting uh, situation, to tell you the truth. Anyway, couldn't tell you anything about the game yet. Maybe after I play it, and you'll, you'll get to watch me struggle through trying to cope with these rules in play, <laughs> maybe then I'll be able to come back with something. But I can tell you right off, the rules are a big